Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and today I'm going to give a talk that uh, I gave at the uh, AOM uh, Orthopedic Medicine Conference in Seattle, and it's on a stem cell research update. So my background began using stem cells to treat orthopedic conditions, uh, really the first in the U.S. in 2005. Uh, published 18 peer-reviewed publications in that area and we have a university style stem cell research lab that's part of our practice and we're tracking more than 10,000 stem cell treated patients in a nonprofit registry going back to 2005. So just some stem cell basics. Uh, we have adult stem cells embryonic and induced pluripotent uh, we're going to be focusing here on mesenchymal stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, and uh, the adult stem cell piece of that. So if you look at where stem cells can come from, or at least adult stem cells, we're primarily talking about bone marrow and adipose. And we'll talk about some urban myths about the differences between those two. Um, but these are just some of the cells here listed that... Uh, can come from bone marrow. That includes stem cells and many other cells, as you can see. And if we talk about different types of stem cell procedures, we've got uh, allogeneic procedures, and the biggest ones we're kind of seeing out there right now are am amniotic and cord blood. We'll talk about that, as well as autologous, which again are primarily bone marrow and adipose. That means from the same patient. If we look at the allogeneic stuff, primarily amniotic placental or cord stem cells, and regrettably, there's a lot of people advertising that they're doing amniotic or cord or placental stem cells, but it's primarily a scam. So uh, these tissues are not registered to contain any viable cells. And sales reps will often claim that they have viable mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, their FDA registration state that there are no viable cells. And we've tested many of these products and found, again, no viable cells. Um, and we've also tested to try to see if they actually help mesenchymal stem cells, uh, let's say older mesenchymal stem cells, perform better, and that didn't happen. We've also tested to try to see uh, how much in the way of growth factors they have, because there's this sense that these things are growth factor rich, when in fact uh, they have lower growth factor levels in general than just uh, uh, 1x platelet-rich plasma. And they may have other positive effects, but we don't have much data right now. And be very careful in reviewing product data. This is something put out by uh, this this company, Surgenix, which uh, has uh, Surforce here off on the right. And what I found interesting about this uh, crazy thing that they put out is that Amniofix here in the middle is a known dead cell product. In fact, it is dehydrated um, and uh, it's gamma irradiated. So it's, it's a dead cell product. And here they're trying to show you how many uh, viable cells their product has, and they're claiming somehow that 36% of the cells in uh, Amniofix through some uh, miracle, because this would have to be a miracle because the uh, Amniofix is gamma irradiated, which kills cells. It's also dehydrated, which kills cells. And so then they're comparing that to their cell numbers. So we know that this, quote, viability testing that they did is wrong. Uh, and we see a lot of this stuff. You can go on the, my website uh, and on the blog and see very, very clearly uh, that I've taken apart a number of these, uh, these data sheets put out by these companies. Uh, and so far, we have yet to test a single amniotic product that has any live stem cells in it. Now, moving over to the autologous side, that's from the same patient. Uh, there are a number of uh, different types of uh, procedures out there. Um, we've got a, a simple bone marrow same day stem cell procedure. That's where fractions uh, containing stem cells are isolated just via centrifugation. 
You could also grow those cells out, but if you do, the FDA here in the U.S. considers that a drug. On the fat stem cell side, you've got simple fat grafts, which is basically just taking the fatty tissue and, and injecting it. And then uh, you can digest away uh, some of the structural tissue and actually try to uh, separate out the stem cells. But the problem is, even though there are a lot of doctors doing that, the FDA considers that a prescription drug that requires approval. So those doctors are violating the law by doing that. And then we have, obviously, you can grow those cells out, those fat cells out. So those are the five different kinds of autologous stem cell procedures that are out there uh, worldwide. So when it comes to bone marrow concentrate, Basically, uh, you take bone marrow aspirate, that's very different than uh, a structural piece of bone marrow, and you centrifuge that, and you get basically a number of different layers, and the layer that everyone likes to go after is this middle one right here, or the buffy coat. And uh, one of the things you need to recognize is most of the world literature in orthopedic applications is on cultured bone marrow MSCs, and more recently, we're seeing more research now on what's called bone marrow concentrate or a same day uh, bone marrow stem cell procedure. Now this is a, uh, an annual infographic I've been putting out for about the last four or five years, somewhere in there. And each one of these little circles that you see here uh, represents a different study, in this case on bone marrow uh, stem cells used for orthopedic applications. And so each one of these little uh, circles is a hyperlink, and if you click on it, you can get out to uh, the actual study. But if we add up the N, meaning the number of patients that are represented by all these different studies, and we have here the years off to the left here, uh, it's uh, more than 8,500 patients have had their uh, have had their results reported in the world literature. And uh, last time I ran this was just a few days ago, and about 45% of those patients were patients that we had treated. So we've published a lot. Uh, all of our studies here are in yellow, uh, so you can get a sense of, of how our studies fit amongst all the different studies that are out there in orthopedic bone marrow stem cell research. So let's look at fat or adipose. Basically, the concept with adipose stem cells uh, is that they're primarily pericytes. They primarily live around blood vessels, and you want to break up blood vessels and then suck out the little pieces of the blood vessels. Uh, and that's how that works. So that's why liposuction is used. Now, if you go ahead and you get uh, a lipo aspirate, which is fat through a liposuction, um, you can actually add an enzyme that will digest all of the structural tissue, and then you centrifuge that, and this little pellet you get at the bottom is called SBF, or stromovascular fraction. That's a same-day fat stem cell procedure. Um, and this pellet contains lots and lots of different cells, and a small percentage of those cells are mesenchymal stem cells. So what's in uh, this adipose tissue? Uh, you've got mesenchymal stem cells uh, or stromal cells listed here, pericytes, endothelial progenitor cells, mu cells, lots of different types of things are in that mix. And if we look at bone marrow versus adipose, it's really interesting because there's a lot of hyperbole that goes on in the adipose or the fat world. So how do these two tissues compare? You know, one of the things that you can always be sure of is if you hear wildly different claims out there, like 500 times more, 2,000 more, 1,000 times more, then it's probably pretty shaky science. So can't go to a medical conference without hearing at some point that fat has a thousand times or two thousand more stem cells um, in it 
than uh, bone marrow. And so I decided to actually dig into this a little bit and see if this is true or if this is fiction. And the answer is it's mostly fiction. If we do the math, um, stem cell counts are reported as a percentage of the total number of nucleated cells in the tissue. That means as a percentage of the total cells that are in the tissue. And initially, it seems that the comparison really favors fat. For instance, uh, flow cytometry studies show that fat has 1% to 5% of the total nucleated cells that are stem cells versus 0.1 to 0.5% of bone marrow. The problem is that this is basically a fifth grade math error. Uh, the denominator is quite different for these two tissues. So if we look, we see that there's a huge difference in the number of nucleated cells, and, that, and that's what we're comparing to here, between the two tissues. Basically, that, uh, that bone marrow has about 100 times more nucleated cells than adipose tissue. So if we run the math, the bottom line is they're pretty equivalent. So adipose doesn't have 500 to 2,000 times more stem cells. In addition, bone marrow has dramatically more hematopoietic stem cells than fat. And for orthopedic purposes, these can be very, very, very useful. Finally, if you look at the uh, procedural risks, you know, it's often, it's pretty funny. You can read that, oh God, bone marrow aspiration is awful and the liposuction is great. Uh, it, it's actually the opposite. Uh, the procedural risks of liposuction are dramatically higher than a bone marrow aspirate. And that makes sense. Your job during liposuction is to really destroy and eat up tissue. Now, another common thing that we see out there is that you can go to a lot of websites and you can see a lot of doctors claiming that they're doing a fat stem cell procedure, but really what they're doing is a fat graft procedure. Quite a different animal. And a fat graft procedure, remember from what I said before, is just taking the fat, taking off the oil and the red blood cells and you get you know, uh, the, the, the lipo aspirate and then you inject that. Now, uh, there are companies that make these mechanical emulsifiers so that you can kind of um, really liquefy the fat so that you can re-inject it, let's say, into a knee. And we did this way back in 2012, and it seemed like we may have even gotten something on the bottom that looked like it could be a fraction that maybe had some stem cells in it. The problem was that there were no viable cells in here. Really what we were getting was microscopic chunks of fat where the stem cells were, were still imprisoned in all the collagen. And then in 2014, we actually uh, tested a sophisticated vibration assisted liposuction machine, uh, hopefully because that was gonna give us uh, some stem cells and that the dissociation of the stem cells from their collagen prisons, so to speak, would happen during the liposuction procedure, but it never really worked out that way. And there are new generation uh, fat processing systems where you can actually put some fat in with some glass beads and supposedly get these microparticles smaller and smaller. But the bottom line is, again, we haven't found any viable uh, cells because the problem is that the stem cells are still imprisoned in these microscopic chunks of fat. So in the end, injecting fat into a joint may or may not be a good idea. Um, our published paper didn't show a difference between bone marrow plus fat versus just bone marrow alone. On the other hand, there's at least one large case series that seems to show that just injecting fat into a joint worked as well as a stromal vascular fraction where you're taking the stem cells out of the fat. One of the problems with that study, however, is that 60% of the uh, decision on whether or not a patient got better uh, wasn't determined by the patient, it was determined by the physician. 
So the data in that uh, paper is a little bit questionable in my mind, because obviously when you're getting outcome, you look at what the patient says, not what the doctor says. Doctors frequently will tell you their patients did great, then you go ask the patient and the patient says not really. So let's look at an orthobiologics clinical research summary from a 30,000 foot view. One of the biggest interesting trends in orthopedic research in general over the last decade plus has been that the evidence base for orthopedics kind of sucks. Uh, what I mean by that is orthopedic surgery only has about 20% of all the procedures that are performed that have high level evidence that they actually work. And in fact, this has been uh, criticized or this has been brought forth in lots of different medical journals. Here's one of those articles. Um, and you know, the British Medical Journal in this article described the orthopedic surgery evidence base as scandalously poor. And right now, as I do the math, and this is without adding a knee replacement, and I'll tell you, um, I'll talk about knee replacement in a second. 53% of common elective orthopedic surgeries have been shown to be ineffective in clinical trials. Now, what this tells me as someone who is working in interventional orthopedics, someone who is trying to uh, re-swizzle the whole orthopedic thing by using stem cells, PRP, other regenerative medicine um, types of treatments, but coming up with new ways to do old procedures, is that there's tremendous opportunity in rewriting the orthopedics textbook. And if we look more specifically as orthobiologics or orthopedic stem cell research, one of the biggest trends of the last two years that I have found personally very interesting is that we're starting to get some research on fat stem cells. Now we still don't have a lot, as I'll show you, but we have enough where fat probably needs to be entering into this discussion. Uh, now, all the circles that you see here are bone marrow studies, but these squares uh, off on the ends here uh, show you that, you know, 2010, uh, or 2011, we had one study, 2012, we had one study, 2013, we have one study, then 2014 comes around and we get three fat studies, and then 2015 comes around and we get three more fat studies, um, and then 2016 comes around and we get uh, four fat studies. So we're starting to see more research in fat. Now realize this is on the type of fat stem cell procedure that's illegal in the United States. So that's a problem because this is not a procedure that you should be doing in the United States. But it is interesting just from a scientific standpoint that we're starting to see more things published in orthopedic applications. Now, we still have the vast majority of research published uh, in the world of bone marrow stem cells. But you can see here that this slice of the pie now, uh, based on the number of studies and the total patients by stem cell type, uh, we're starting to see more information. So that's, that's exciting news. Um, the biggest problem is our FDA has got to get out of its own way to start allow us to, doing, allow us to do these types of, of fat stem cell procedures where most of the research lives. So are stem cell procedures safe? Um, these are the three main studies. Two of these are our studies. One was published by Hernigal. Um, this is our study here on culture expanded stem cells. Uh, this is Hernigal's uh, study on same day stem cells. And this is our uh, larger study. I think it's the largest in the world to date on the safety of both same day and culture expanded stem cells. So based on these three studies, yes, there's very good safety profile for these procedures. So let's start looking now at specific areas. I'll talk a little about shoulder rotator cuff repair or shoulder rotator cuff tears. And stem cells may be able to help rotator cuff uh, healing. This is a nice study done by Hernigau in 2004 
that basically showed that by performing a bone marrow stem cell injection uh, after surgery, they were able to half the re-tear rate of rotator cuff tears. This is actually uh, some data from our about halfway complete uh, rotator cuff randomized controlled trial uh, that shows a very nice break here between the control group uh, and our active patients who are getting much better relief and much better function. Um, and this is just with a same day stem cell injection precisely into the tear with no surgery. Now, knee osteoarthritis is another very big area here, because if we look at all the research I showed you, there's a tremendous amount on knee osteoarthritis. Not nearly as much uh, research exists on, uh, on some of these other uh, areas, as you'll see. Now, one of the interesting opportunities in knee osteoarthritis, and again, I look, this, I look at this as an opportunity, is that uh, right now, we only really have one randomized controlled trial um, showing that knee osteoarthritis, uh, or I'm sorry, that knee replacement is effective. So that's interesting. This, uh, it's called total, uh, total knee arthroplasty, or TKA. That's also known as a knee replacement. Interestingly enough, you needed to amputate five to six knee joints, meaning do knee replacements in five to six patients, to get one that reported that he or she got a 15% functional improvement or more and three and four patients by one year just doing physical therapy uh, decided not to get their knee replacement. So interesting information. More importantly, recently, these two government data sets that are tracking osteoarthritis patients going forward, uh, when, when the authors looked at how well those patients were doing after their knee replacement, they concluded that knee replacement was not cost effective for most of the patients who are actually getting this procedure. What was interesting is only the most severely disabled patients seem to be benefiting. And the, on average, again, this doesn't mean you might not know some guy who did well with a knee replacement, or that person might be you, but on average, most patients were not benefiting substantially. And if we look at our data, and this is uh, recent, uh, about two months old, we're tracking 5,852 um, knee stem cell procedures going back to 2005. And about 3,450 of those have the primary diagnosis as knee osteoarthritis. And the uh, knee replacement rate, despite treatment at one to two years, is only 12.7%. So we have a lot of patients that are opting not to get their knee replacement after a stem cell procedure. Now, this is a little bit of biased data set because these are patients that didn't want a, uh, a knee replacement to begin with. And if we look at our knee osteoarthritis randomized controlled data, uh, which is uh, just being put together for publication now, you can see here that compared to a control group, these knee stem cell patients do quite well. So we should have this submitted here in the next uh, month or two for publication. And this is a short list of some of the studies that have been done in knee osteoarthritis with stem cells. Now realize that outside of our very large case series here, you can see that the number of patients in these studies is relatively small. And there's only one study here that showed that this didn't work, a knee stem cell procedure. Uh, and that study was a little bit bizarre in the way it was done. It was also likely done with way too low a dose of cells. Uh, hip osteoarthritis, much less published. You have our large uh, case series, and then you've got two much smaller studies here. So there's much, much less published in hip osteoarthritis. And if we look at degenerative disc disease, um, you have, again, a bunch of very small studies uh, with small numbers here, including ours. We have another study that's uh, we're uh, 
It's in the publication process right now. Should be published here in the next month or two that expands this, this smaller number five out, I think, to 30-something patients. And I think that'll be the largest study when it's finally out. But realize, again, uh, less data on uh, lumbar degenerative disc disease. And also recognize that we've published in the area of stem cell injections to heal ACL tears, as you see here, and that this is a precise fluoroguided technique. Uh, we've published one paper so far. We have a larger case series that's in the pre-publication process, and we currently have a randomized controlled trial. So please don't try this at home, kitties. And what I mean by that is that an ACL stem cell injection procedure, as we have, have come to know it, um, it can't be done blind. It can't be done under ultrasound. It needs to be a fluoroscopy or an x-ray guidance only procedure. And that's because you need to get the stem cells in both bundles at both ends. And that can't be done under ultrasound. In fact, I just saw a professional quarterback who had had an ultrasound guided ACL stem cell procedure done at a very famous sports clinic. Um, they had done an ultrasound. They had botched the procedure. It was done poorly. Uh, his ACL ended up tearing further rather than healing, and hopefully we've been able to get him back uh, to where he needs to be. Uh, but again, uh, it was a good example of how these procedures can't be done under ultrasound. So in conclusion, stem cells are here to stay. The early clinical research data in neosteoarthritis looks very strong. Uh, there's data coming in many other clinical applications. And the data for fat stromovascular fraction, which is illegal in the US to produce, looks very strong. Uh, the US legal procedure in fat, which is a fat graft, um, there's much less data on that right now. So thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day.